Good evening, everyone. Uh, we are the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, and this is a panel discussion to, to start off our uh, DragonCon 2016. Uh, joining me on the panel are Bob Novella. Hey, everybody. Kara Santa Maria. Howdy. Jay Novella. Hey, guys. And we have a special guest, Adam Savage from the Mythbusters. Do not try this at home. I am what you call an expert. <laughs> Evan Bernstein, everyone. Thank you. Hi, Atlanta. Evan, how many people have come up to you and I thought you were Adam Savage? Your daughter is keeping a very accurate count on this. I think the count is 15 wow. as of right wow. now. Uh, yeah. People who are approaching me who are talking to me as if I'm Adam. <laughs> And I, I have to break their heart and sort of tell them, no, I'm sorry, it's not. So a few people were actually crestfallen by it. It was sad to see. I was joking around with Evan, like, hey, Jay Novella and Adam Savage were making out on the street corner. <laughs> but he wouldn't I could go for totally it. totally ruin Adam's reputation yeah, right? by doing all sorts of crap here. <laughs> but I'm a good guy, so. Right. So uh, for, for this panel, we wanted to talk about the intersection of the SGU and science and skepticism and geek culture. Because why not? Because we're at Dragon Con. Uh, and we're going to do some Q&A you know, towards the end, but we wanted to get started by asking each other some questions. Uh, we're going to start, uh, we'll just go down, down the, the line here. Uh, we'll start with you, Evan. Uh, so first, I want to know what, what franchise in speculative fiction uh, do you think represents science and skepticism the best, and then we're going to also follow that up with which one do you think represents it the worst, or does the worst hatchet job of representing science and skepticism? Ooh, okay, so a franchise that, that we're looking for, I mean, you know, uh, I think people, first thing that comes to their mind, you know, Star Trek, Star Wars, maybe some, some people will uh, go, along, go more along those lines. Um, there are a couple of movies uh, that, in particular, I don't know if you'd call them franchises, but uh, that sort of stand out for me as far as as far as good science goes. Um, I'll go back a little little ways. I think Blade Runner was one of the first ones that sort of had made that impression on me back in the back in the early '80s, and because I was I felt I was seeing something here that I had not seen before, when, which was mostly up to that time in my life, of more of a fantasy sort of setting for uh, for, for science fiction. But but this one dealt with you know certainly that near future feel and. Had had, uh, I think, a lot of aspects and things uh, to it that we're actually, you know, kind of almost starting to wrestle with now uh, yeah. in, in modern times. Uh, and, and as someone else also pointed out to me, also including the flying cars, which are, are coming to Europe, not maybe not America soon, but I think we're going we're gonna to see those in Europe very, very, very soon. Uh, so that had an early impact on me. Uh, some of the more recent uh, movies that uh, I think did it for me um, was certainly the movie WALL-E. Um, and you know, we, we think of that sort of as a kid's movie in a sense, and yeah, it is that, but I thought, felt it was also very adult, very uh, to the point with, with the science, and, and a great, uh, you know, clarion call for, for you know, what, the, what sort of a despotic, uh, a dystopian future sort of could look like, and, and could really come to this sort of fruition in which our environment totally goes to shit, and people, uh, you know, Back. Can't move anymore. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. They get, get into such a state that they, 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 you know, can't get off their asses, and you know they'll die these horrible. <laughs> and I'm in the movie short theater, and I'm like, look at those people. They can't even move. I'm like shoving popcorn down. <laughs> They're disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, and and I, I, although I'm up here, you know, looking like looking like Adam and everything. Um, the other thing that's been, you know, certainly uh, very very positive as far as science goes, I, th I think, is the MythBusters. Yeah. Now, even though they're not conducting actual scientific experiments, you know, and this is what they tell you, but they really do give the, the, uh, the layperson at home uh, an excellent example of um, how to um, falsify. Basi yeah. Basically, it's a, it's a total exercise in the falsification part of the scientific method, which is wonderful. It's something you don't really hear much focused on or talked about in the schools, uh, at least when I was going to school. So I, I think they've done a tremendous, tremendous service for science yeah. and skepticism. Yeah, getting back to the, um, the near future 
concept. So there's another movie that I think does an even better job than Blade Runner of representing the near future, and that's Minority Report. Yeah. Good and point. so not, not many movies really try to do that. They usually, first of all, they don't go far enough in the future. Like they go, and I think Blade Runner did this. You know, because it goes like 20 years in the future, and they're really portraying 50 years in the future. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a very common mistake. And then they also don't. But at try the time, at the time, it seems reasonable. It seems sure, reasonable yeah. to at the time, but of course, that but 20 years down the road, you're like, whoa, that was way off. <laughs> yeah. But Minority Report, I thought, was really in the sweet spot. They, you know, as far as how far f forward they went, and they really tried to extrapolate technology out. They, they definitely. Made some mistakes already, like they thought cell phones would keep shrinking mm -hmm. when now, now they didn't anticipate smartphones. Did Philip Dick also do yeah. write the book Minority Report? Yeah. yeah, so we're talking, you know, the same author, yeah. basically both, yeah, yeah, both yeah, yeah. of these movies. No, I agree, so. but I, I do like Parallels that there. attempt to like really accurately predict the near future. That's yeah. yeah, it's not easy to do. Jay, what do you think? Um, to answer both the positive and the negative, I, I went with the same thing. I, I was going to go with uh, the, the latest reboot of Battlestar Galactica, where there was a lot of things about that show that I thought were really cool. Like they, it was quiet in outer space, which they, they did an excellent job of portraying. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really great. Um, you know, I like the idea that they, they had the Cylons, and even though they looked identical to humans and everything, you know. It was provocative and it didn't feel wrong, right? So they, they did a good job of making you buy that. Um, and even the space travel, like even though they don't get into gravity, which I thought would have been cool if they just talked about, you know, they have FTL. Artificial gravity yeah, a little bit, yeah. They have FTL drives and we bought that, you know, they could have done something with the gravity. But I just liked the feel of that show a lot and I thought their space travel and everything seemed and felt legit. However, um, the very last episode, I hear because I never let myself watch it, um, I heard it was garbage. Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm giving it the negative on that too, because they had to always at the very end they had to pull the you know God in the machine BS and it was a total betrayal. Yeah. So I mean we were, we were giving the over under on like how many times how many on how, how many panels at Dragon Con does somebody trash the last episode of, of Battlestar Galactica? So we're going to add to that statistic. So the, through, I loved the whole series up to the last episode. The um, be, be, partly because it felt like hard science fiction. I think it's what you're saying, yeah. Jay. And the whole time I think. Oh God, this is so cool! Like, there's there is definitely a hard science fiction explanation for everything that's going on. Yeah. You know, some aliens transplanted humans somewhere at some time, and which direction was it in, and how does it all tie together? Where are they now? What are they doing? And you know, then there's little clues drop throughout the series that you think are relating to this interesting deep backstory. Yeah. And then the last episode's like, nah, it's all just gods and angels. <laughs> what? Yeah. It's just all mystical mumbo yeah, jumbo at terrible. the end. It was a complete betrayal. It was like yeah. the absolute worst writing, and it, d it will forever get trashed for that, and it deserves to be, because it was just such a bait and switch. The whole se series was a bait and switch. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, at one point, I was actually thinking, hey, the Cylons are sentient. They have a right to exist. You know, like, I was actually going down that road, like, all right, I'm going to be cool about that, even though I'm, like, a human, and, and the heroes Jay, of the toasters, show. toasters, Jay. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I guess both my votes. I think yeah. everyone's familiar with yeah. that. We'll flip over to Bob. May already? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with some recent stuff that I've really enjoyed that was that's very accurate, I think. The Expanse. Steve, we mm -hmm. talked about The Expanse. Yeah. Whoa. I mean, I, there were scenes I was like, oh my god, this is exactly what would happen in Lou G. That was fantastic. Yeah. They didn't have to do it, um, but they really thought about it. They take it very seriously. I love this show because it's, what is it, a couple hundred years in the future? Yeah, they go far enough in the future where you don't. Yeah, you don't. Now, have to I think in a couple hundred years, some things will, some technology will, will over completely overshadow that that civilization at that time. That, that's just my opinion. But what they did show, it, it was basically a solar system that's completely colonized, advanced ships, no warp drive, nothing like that. Not even no artificial gravity, right? I mean, no, just that, just yeah, really just an extrapolation of current technology, and we have colonize the solar system. Yeah. And everything is pretty straight apart. So I, I yeah. love that. Just for, for the pure reality that they went with. I love, Bob, I love so that. So no FTL, they, but they, no. they had fast enough ships where you can in your, in, you know, get to planets without it being too long? It takes a while, dude. Sure, it takes, it takes a, a while. Time, yeah. okay. Absolutely. But, but fast enough that you can keep the story going. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, what about the bad one? Which one do you think killed it? Have we gotten to the bad one yet? 
Wait. Did Evan give his bad review? No, I did, but that's all right. Oh, okay. yeah. I'll mention I, another one that I enjoy that's not necessarily so accurate. Um, Dark Matter, I'm, I'm really enjoying. Mm -hmm. There's there's some things that are that I think are accurate, but of course they've got you know this is farther in the future, so they've got some some uh, you know they've got FTL. Yeah. They even got this new cool drive called the Blink Drive. That <laughs> I mean, all right, it lets them basically create a wormhole from one point of space to any other point in the universe and pop there in, in, instantaneously. All right, but I. For me, that's a gimme. That's just a cool gimme. You, if you want to drive the plot, if you want to have a galactic civilization, you need something like that. Otherwise, you don't have a story. So I'm okay with that. The other things that are, the other aspects of that story, I enjoy. The, you know, the computers, the androids, the technology is still really cool and somewhat realistic, uh, but not as realistic as the yeah. Expanse. So you guys are talking a lot about just portrayal of science. You know, just the, is is it accurately portrayed or or not? But um, is there anything that you think uh, does a good job of promoting, say, scientists or science as an endeavor or critical thinking versus, you know, something that you think really mm -hmm. does a disservice, you know, to human intelligence? You, what do you think, Kara? Well, I, I think for me, you know, obviously the most recent example is The Martian. Um, that in so many ways um, was an extension of the scientific method. It was a celebration of the scientific method. Really the protagonist, Mark Watney, and the other protagonist is the scientific method. It's about sciencing the shit out of things. It's about taking problems and solving them. Um, and the fact that a book could be written where it's just problem solving after problem solving and it's still such a page turner and um, so fascinating, I think is a real testament to, to the author. I also love that in a way it, it follows the scientific method because it was kind of a peer reviewed book. Like mm -hmm. the whole process by which he wrote it was that he uh, put chapter after chapter online and individual readers, many of whom were scientists, right. did the fact checking and helped him um, you know, ensure that the actual content of the book was as accurate as possible. Yep. There were a couple things that were not accurate and he made concessions to that in order to forward the plot, but it was kind of known from the beginning. Um, and then I would say a more historical example for me would be Ray Bradbury, not because he was even a sci-fi author, because if you had asked him, he would have said he wasn't, but because there was a, he was very prescient in, with regards to societal ills and the scientific relationship between those things. I think that he did a very good job of understanding the dangers of plastic in like 1940, you know, and um, different things like that, like kind of taking something that we knew, or maybe we didn't know, but somehow he knew, was going to be um, a scientific or technological improvement in many ways, and looking at the dark side of that, yeah. uh, he, he was really brilliant at it. Mm -hmm. um, but gosh, in terms of what was, what's like the worst science, yeah. there's so much bad science. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I'm going to say a really unpopular answer. Um, don't throw stones at me. But like Star Wars is not good sci-fi. <gasps> like, but you guys know that. Yeah. Exactly. It's and it's not, not even meant to be sci-fi. Sci but like opera. the, yeah. the sci-fi is terrible. Okay, like, that's you know, enough. Guards, <laughs> guards, move on. We heard you, now move on. We really suffer so much. <laughs> Um, Bob, did you have a... Shut he did not shoot first. The correct statement is Han shot. Yeah. <laughs> Rito didn't shoot at all. Yeah. <laughs> Expect more from you, for Christ's sake. <laughs> any, any other negatives, Bob? Any ones that you thought... Like, all right, well, let, me, let me throw out... Um, uh, now I'm blanking on the TV series... You know, the truth is out there. Yeah. I'm sorry. The X Files. X Files. The X Files. That's what I was yeah. So yeah, I hate. I loved watching the X Files, but I had to completely separate the skeptic self from watching it. Mm -hmm. It was. It really presented skepticism in an awful light. Because did you watch the whole thing? Pretty much. I think yeah, I watched through the I whole did. thing. Um, it was entertaining. It, you know, it was mind candy, and some of the characters were fun. But the it was you were. It was a universe in which the skeptic was always wrong, right? And the scientific method always led you to the wrong answer. And the solution always came down to just believing. If you just have an open mind and believe, 
that will lead you somehow to the truth. And critical thinking and skepticism was just an obstacle in your way. Mm -hmm. I don't it like was, that universe. Yeah, it was. It was. So that was. I thought was. It was terrible. And and you know, I have to mention it because it was so popular. It's not and, an uncommon device either, right? Because no, we often see uh, like yeah. the mad scientist oh, yeah. kind of archetype, which is quite dangerous. It's it's always nefarious, right? Mm -hmm. The yeah. scientist always is up to something no good, and that this idea that somehow you're like narrow-minded if you're a skeptic. Yeah, it's right. an, you're a naysayer. Right. Yeah, that's really yeah, yeah. common. And in you the see culture. it even in you know popular TV shows. It's very common for me working in television that my agent will come to me and say, you know, we got a call for for a show. Um, are you interested? And it's like token skeptic. Mm -hmm. Like you know, there's the panel of the credulous people, and then there's the token skeptic who basically is the bad guy. Yeah. And it's like I don't I don't want that yeah. role. Richard Saunders played the bad guy on uh, the, the one. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Do you know what actually did the opposite of that, which we we didn't mention, and we don't even think of as a science fiction show, is Scooby Doo. Yeah. yeah. Got, I mean, they oh, did yeah, such a good yeah. job. Of, it was never really a ghost. It was never really a monster. It was like a dude in a mask. Yeah, but until they rebooted the damn show, and then they made it all real, they, they oh, ruined it. No, did we're you guys watch what was a reboot no, of Scooby Doo? Classic. No. Don't even go there. <laughs> How about you, Steve? Um, well, I gave one of the, the negatives. Uh, the other, I'm going to leave another negative, and this is a, a weird one. It's Jimmy Neutron. The what? Oh, no. <laughs> what? So, well, I'm going to tell you what I don't like about Brain Jimmy Blast. Neutron. Brain Blast. Yeah, that's exactly what I don't like about it. <laughs> so, Jimmy Neutron's a cartoon about a, br a genius kid, and it's, a, it's an entertaining cartoon. And, and the technology is really cool. It is, but what I don't like about it is that he's a freak. You know, mm. the, the, the kid scientist is a freak, and he with solves, a big head. With a he big solves head. problems <laughs> almost by magic. Like, science is, is treated as if it's, a, it's, um, it's magic. It's yeah. a black box. He has a brain blast, you know, where you just suddenly, the answer... Inspiration, But yeah. there's no process, you know, there's no real celebration of critical thinking or of, of science or of specific knowledge. It's exactly the opposite of The Martian. Like, in The Martian, the reason why it was so compelling to read it was because you were solving the problems along with the character. Yeah, I mean, but there is an audience difference there. I mean, it's a kid's <laughs> but show. But this is yeah, the audience that we need to make sure doesn't think that that's the process. Yeah, yeah but again, Scooby Doo. I know. They I'm not saying. Process. I know. I know. I'm just saying, though. You know, it, you, you it's, can't it's, compare those I, two shows not, together. Of course not. But the point is, it's celebrating something which I think isn't useful in celebrating, which is just, you know, the kid it was just a, a raw talent, just had raw genius. And everything you know just came to him in a brain blast, right? Yeah. But what you so kids are then made to feel as if, well, if I'm not a super genius, science isn't for me, yeah. and there's no point right. in no, me, absolutely. you know, pursuing that. That's only for these freakish genius kids, you know, like Jimmy Neutron, rather than making it accessible or celebrating hard work. Like yeah. if you celebrate work, like you know the the Watney character did in mm. The Martian, that is very practical and that is very useful. You you know if you celebrate just you know, genetic talent, okay, what do you do with that? It's, it doesn't really yeah. help yeah. anybody. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm just using, matters, just using right? Neutron as an example of that mean. That, yeah, that, that, that yeah, type that of... trope. Yeah, gotcha. That, you know, there's, there, there are tropes in, in um, you know, the, the movies and in TV that are anti-science, in my opinion. So mm -hmm. science as sort of magic, I, I don't like. The mad scientist trope, I really don't like. But it. Dexter's Laboratory. Yeah. <laughs> he had a that's, lab. That's okay. He did, yeah, he he did, did real a, problem he did solving. Yeah. 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 He was irascible and his he hated his sister, but it was But he was like fun. cool too. Like he wasn't, you know, he wasn't a total outcast, right? <laughs> <laughs> and he had those uh -oh. cool boots. You know, but, and, um oh. Yeah. I don't know. He, you don't see many of his friends except the evil was it Mandark? And he was clearly the evil scientist. Oh, he really watched the show. Was, was he an outcast? <laughs> I don't even remember watching yeah. with my daughter years ago. I don't remember. A show that, you know, I, I'm kind of an odd duck on the panel. Um, one of these things is not like the other. I'm not a novella. Um, hey, Evan. Um, hey, girl. <laughs> I'm also a chick, if you didn't notice. No, but another thing is that um, although I uh, appreciate and... Um, try my best when it comes to certain aspects of geek culture, the type of sci-fi that I'm really into tends not to be, I think, the most celebrated of sci-fi. Like what? I, I'm not that into fantasy. Just like, if you're like, what's your favorite sci-fi author? I'm like, Ugh, Ray Bradbury. You know, like, I don't come to a lot of the really celebrated franchises because I haven't watched them. Like, you talk yeah. about Stargate or you talk about these things. I don't have a lot of background in them. One show that I watch almost religiously on television, which I think is so good at celebrating science and process, is Forensic Files. 
itself, which is not a science fiction show. I mean, it's a, it's a celebration of science fact. It's not on a sci-fi network. It's on HLN, which is pretty sad. But um, do, they as have, somebody, do they have warp drive or anything like that? There's anything? no warp drive. Phasers, none of that? But it's such a great oh. show that a lot of the public watches that really celebrate sure. science and I think celebrate scientific process that taps into, um, it, it taps outside of geek culture, which is oftentimes, I think, an entree to good mm -hmm. science, and sometimes we do yeah, it a disservice right. by having bad science. So. It's a documentary, I haven't seen it in a while, but it's, like a, yeah. it's a documentary about how, how these crimes were solved. Yeah, and right? they always take you down a path of, but what if, blah, 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 and, oh, no, we didn't find evidence to support mm -hmm. that, and it's no, really, yeah, that's great. yeah it's, sure. it celebrates that. Yeah, I mean, along those lines, um, there's Dr. House, so I'll yeah. just give like my medical one, which is a mixed bag, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah they're, he's smart, but there's a process, and you know, it, it does it certainly value knowledge, but the process is so wrong that he <laughs> follows, yeah. you know, and it completely instills in the public the sort of wrong idea of how medicine works. I actually have to call it the Dr. House syndrome, and I have to undo everything when I'm mm. dealing with patients because they why do they want you to like turn into an a-hole and get mad at them at one point? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, well, they, you know, it's it's you know, the first of all, it's a th you know, it's, it's a three-act show, so they have to diagnose thing in series yeah you know rather than just doing the differential out of the gate because then the show would be over in five minutes um, <laughs> so it's like oh no this is what it is and then let's treat him for that okay you know but how about testing for things that it, other things that it could be like you know considering the alternative is, is, a, is a good idea um, and then like every problem is solved by making some really obscure diagnosis that you have to be really smart. They to always make. have Legionnaire's disease. Yeah. Did you notice that? Yeah, well, that, that's a good one. That's <laughs> yeah. good. They kind of ran out of the interesting <laughs> rare diseases early on, and then they had to recycle them. But so, you know, every patient thinks they just need to find a smart enough doctor to diagnose a rare enough disease, and then they'll be cured. And right? some obscure test, right? Like, yeah. Dr. Novella, I need a whole body scan. You're like, yeah. no, I think you have a cold. Like, yeah. it's just a cold. Yeah. <laughs> so that's another one where there's a lot of TV tropes in there, and in very subtle ways but very impactful ways it alters the way people think about how science works and how you know what the process is and how we think critically so I pay a lot of attention to those things so it really affects the way people think but let's pivot a bit uh, the, the next sort of topic I wanted to get into a little bit related to what we were talking about but this is going to personalize it a little bit and that is so what character or it could also be like what franchise do you think um, speaks to you personally the most and if like somebody knew that you really really liked that character or that franchise that would tell them a lot about you. Jay, mm -hmm. why don't we start with you this time? Well, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm a diehard Star Trek Star Wars fan for two completely different reasons. I yeah. mean, I, I, can talk, I can talk romantically about both of those um, is there anything more obscure that you just really love, even if it's like a yes, I love the I love the robot series by Isaac yeah. Asimov. Yeah. Um, I really loved his, you know, he, the the human characters that he usually writes that interact with the robots are always interesting. Like yeah. the uh, Bailey, the, the yeah. police officer, oh, yeah. was really cool, and he was. You know, he was afraid, he was claustrophobic, or no, no, he was the, uh, agoraphobic, he, agoraphobic. agoraphobic. He, yeah, he was afraid of open spaces, and, and it was really a oh, big part of the character, I but I, 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 I remember reading those books and just being like, so into the robots, mm -hmm. the really humanoid robots, and then of course in that series, I'm not going to ruin this. There's a big surprise that's really cool at the right. end, which I thought was cool, and it didn't bother me even though it was a little. Did you just try try to avoid a spoiler alert on an Asimov story? I did. There's okay. young people in the <laughs> audience, sure. okay. you know. Um, I, but I mean, no. Nah, but I really do have to say, Star Trek and Star Wars to me, it's like they're both. There's uh, which one do you like better? <laughs> That's mean. <laughs> and why? Star Wars. What, Star what Wars. Is it, what is it that I don't to you? goddamn know why it's so. It just I, Star Trek to me is about we were kids and we watched it with dad, and it was all about us. And we used to make home videos of us playing all those characters. That that'll never escape me. And I thought the Federation was so cool. The Prime Directive, and the fact that everybody on the Enterprise was a good guy for yeah. the most part. It was a group of good guys trying to do something awesome, and I love that about it. But the heroic journey that happens in movies four, five, and six in Star Wars completely changed my life. Mm -hmm. Like, there are things in that movie that when I watch, like when the, the twin sons, when Luke goes out and he's the farm boy 
wanting more like oh my god when i hear that french horn i mm. want to cry every time yeah. like it's got me I'm, i am seven years old again yeah, yeah. so it, it, that hook will never leave me and, it, and just is it the is it the appeal of it, the adventure you mean you think that's what it is it is i mean i was i was telling someone not too long ago a bigger life i have such a strong desire in my life to go on a real adventure and the sgu other than having children and being married i mean these are profound awesome things but in the sgu has been the biggest adventure I've ever been on in my life. But I, I want I want like a virtual reality adventure now. I want the next level of that. And Star Wars was always that to me. I can always go to those characters and go to that story and totally lose myself in that fantasy of being of being Luke or Han and going on an adventure like that. It just captures me every time. It gets me. Better than Trek. I mean, it, yeah, the yeah, marginally, yeah. Plus, you're dead to me. Plus, <laughs> but Bob, done. Blasters are so much better than phasers. Oh come on. Yes, they are. <laughs> yes, they are. Sorry, no. dude. Yeah. <laughs> I think I would do phasers over blasters, but lightsabers over both. But anyway, <laughs> so Bob, you you uh, would have to say Star Trek. And is there any character from Star Trek that you would say you identify with more than any anyone else? Well, I mean. I was trying to think of who I identified with, and I didn't really, I needed more time to think about it. Uh, but I, if I had to pick somebody from Star Trek, um, I mean, I, I love Data. I loved that he was just a font of, of knowledge, mm -hmm. he, the knowledge he had at his fingertips. But it was more of like jealousy. I mean, the, the guy was an exemplary human in so many ways in terms of knowledge, strength. Um, he was also, uh, what's the quote? He was uh, functional in so many ways. What was that? Yeah. Come on, come on, we know this. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, it's the guy, but it's more of a, but in terms of somebody that, because that, you asked me, who would, you know, who are you more, most like? So you want to be an android is what you're saying. No, no, no. That, that's why <laughs> I that, would pick, that's why I would pick Daniel Jackson from Stargate SG-1. He, he in, was more similar to me than, than Data, Data ever was. Daniel was, he was geeky. He, he loved knowledge. He, he, he loved science and he loved learning and acquiring information. Yeah. Um, but he was also kind of a nice guy empathetic and he was and he was yeah. kind I think so I think if, if I had to compare myself I would like to think I'm, I was closer to him than than a lot of the other science fiction characters that I that I've adored uh, you know growing yeah. up in the past 10 20 years but I mean I have right, guys but what what sci-fi character do you most remind you of Bob <sighs> I know what I would pick hmm. Go ahead. What? it was from uh, Battlestar Galactica I thought the new Baltar is very Gaius much like Baltar. that. Ga Gaius Baltar, yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> Doctor He Gaius betrayed Baltar. the planet and killed how many billions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he, there was, he All had- All Star Wars lovers, by the way. There were, um, yeah, they are, but yeah. Right. They are, um, that character yeah. though has qualities that you have, Bob. Not all of them, of course, yeah, but I yeah, know. without a doubt. Like he was- um, He was a scientist. He was a scientist. He was, he was, you know, I don't want to say mild-mannered, but he had a charm about him that reminds me of Bob a little bit. Keep going. He liked it. <laughs> he liked to have sex with a blonde android or, you know, <laughs> cloned special human. I know that you like that as well. It's a secret. Right? <laughs> Not uh, anymore. <laughs> oh, that's nice. That's okay. I'll, I'll take that. Yeah, and he was an asshole from time to time. <laughs> but that's because, you know, you're my brother. There were, I think there were certain frailties, yeah. I think, that they might share. A little absent-minded perhaps yeah okay but overall <laughs> good guy that. yeah <laughs> sure it was good for you we though you. Yeah. how All about right. Kara it's tough because as a woman we don't have a wealth of strong characters to look up to and to kind of see yourself in especially historically and especially when it comes to science or science fiction um, obviously one that sticks out to me is Dr. Ellie from Contact J Jodie sure. Foster's character mm -hmm. oh, yeah. um, a great character yeah she's because she's you know she's a total badass but she's complicated and she has weaknesses and she has frailties too and I think the best characters are the characters that are well rounded um, I think we often try to overcompensate for weakness when we do see strong female characters like Rey in Star Wars who is amazing and I love her to death but we, we do tend to kind of make up for histories of um, uh, of failing the Bechdel test and so then we have these female characters that are just like strong and, and that's yeah. their only feature which I don't think is that realistic. Um, yeah but the, you're right but the, uh, Ellie from Contact yeah. was human. She right? was human. She was a scientist who was completely human. Mm -hmm. You know she loved her father that drove a lot of what she did. You know obviously the whole you can argue her whole quest was really at some psych psychological level uh, seeking for her father and then the aliens literally you know took the 
form of her father. Yeah. It was a great story, and I thought, yeah, love that, love that character. Very positive view of science and critical thinking, mm -hmm. and and also, you know, but wonder of. Uh, for the universe, and of course, the author Carl Sagan yeah. was brilliant at yeah, he combining got it, those right? things. That was his, that was his thing, yeah. was combining critical, hard thinking with you know on wonder for our existence and the universe and how amazing it is. So, you know, you can't do better than that. Yeah, I mean, and know, Linda Opes, forward. the producer, I think she she was a real champion for women in film at a time when a lot of people weren't, and I I would venture to guess that a lot of young women were actually influenced to go into astronomy um, after seeing that movie <coughs> because they finally saw somebody on screen that represented their hopes and dreams yeah. like they hadn't previously. Mm -hmm. that, that's a good point. I saw the movie. I never read the book. How was the book? The book is good. Read the book, book is good. Very close. How was the Carl Sagan book? Yeah. This is yeah. good. Well, I mean, but it's I a pretty good book. I never yeah. read that. <laughs> <laughs> Did the movie the change the book well, or was, was there a lot of divergence? No, they, they tracked it well. The um, there were the big difference was that in the book a bunch of scientists go in the ship at the end, whereas yeah. in the movie only she goes. So you had the testimony of like five or six scientists at the end, and there was some physical evidence too. In the movie, it was just the word of one person. No, there was physical evidence. Yes. The tape, the well, hours. Yeah, the tape no, just yeah. hours of that's kind of, you know, yeah, yeah. in a race tape was interesting, but that's kind of weak evidence. It's but circumstantial. There was yeah. physical evidence in the book. But in any case, well, it, it wasn't, the evidence wasn't such that they still didn't say it was just a conspiracy. It was still able to oh. deny the, you know, that, that anything actually right, happened. Right, right. But yeah, it was very interesting. Uh, but do you guys think, would, would, does Kara remind you of any character in, from, from science fiction fantasy? I, mean, I think um, uh, Sigourney Weaver's character in Aliens. <laughs> <laughs> Alien or Aliens? Ali aliens. Definitely yeah. Aliens. Really? I, I loved her in Alien, but in Aliens, and Kara, I've gotten to know you very well over the past year since you've been with us. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, you were a warrior, and she, and that character in Aliens was a, she is epic in that movie. She really is. Like, the things that she did, and the, her standoff with the, with the, um, the queen. with the queen, mm. and just, like, show, you know, putting, lowering the flamethrower to the eggs and all that, like, that intimidation, it just was awesome, and I don't know. I'll take I got it. got a little mother, bit of that. In you mother to it. mother. Yeah. I think the, the obvious comparison that I get all the time is, um, Kosama from uh, from Orphan Black. Yeah. I hear this constantly. Actually, Tatiana Maslany, I interviewed her once, and she was like, you're Kosama. Um, just, and it's like, well, I wear glasses, and I study science. Um, it's it's a little <laughs> superficial, but that is one that I hear just constantly. Do you like yeah. that character? I like Kosama a lot, actually. She's one of my favorite of Tatiana's characters on the show. I think I actually identify with the main character more, even though she kind of gets to be a jerk, so maybe I shouldn't say that out loud. No, I like, but, I like uh, that character for you, without yeah, a doubt. Yeah, but towards the end, you you kind of don't like her, um, or towards the end of how far they've gotten in the series. But I do, um, I do really like uh, Kosuma. She's very warm. She's yeah. probably one of her more genuine characters. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, how about you, Steve? Oh, you want to turn to me? Um, so the, the, for me, the quintessential character that I uh, that I really, really identify with and love is is the Doctor from Doctor Who, mm -hmm. and not just because he's called the Doctor and I'm a Doctor. It has actually <laughs> nothing to do with that. It's because. Um, you know, the care, first of all, you know, he's a uh, kind of a cranky old man, right? And <laughs> which is, uh, it's, it's, it's a great atypical hero. He's not a brawny, you know, he's not good looking, uh, at least in a lot, most of his iterations, you know, the couple of recent ones, he, he was younger and, and better looking. And then they, I'm very happy with the fact that they went more back to his roots. And uh, Peter Capaldi's doctor, I think, is doing a fantastic mm -hmm. job. Uh, but he, he solves problems with um, just by you know being very smart and thinking about it, and uh, he is, he's completely pacifistic. So he doesn't solve problems with a gun. He won't pick up a gun. He refuses to you know to to engage in any kind of violence, and yet he is the most dangerous man in the universe you know, because he's yeah. the smartest man in the universe. He's always the smartest man in the room, and that is intimidating. Oh, I get it now. <laughs> 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 but that was it. He saved it for the end. <laughs> All right, yeah, Ev, how about you? Yeah. Ed, come on, like, yeah, you have more to say. No, seriously. Go ahead, Ev. <laughs> That's, that, is a, that is a hero I want 
children looking up. Well, I'll give yeah. you this too. The doctor is an incredible teacher yes. that we sometimes forget. You know, the yeah. doctor has a companion and along the way, the doctor is really sharing a lot of these gifts and helping develop those critical thinking skills in his companion throughout the series. And I appreciate that. And he's very human, even though he's not human. And he mm -hmm. has a real moral center. And sometimes he does things just because he's like, no, no one's dying on my watch today. That's it. Yeah. Just because, you know, he, he feels. And, and if you can combine a powerful intellect with a real human heart, I think that that's, that's a great, a great way to present science. Yeah. You know, I, th I think it's fantastic. Evan. Yeah, I had a little bit of extra time now to sort of dwell on this. <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll, I'll explain this uh, as, best, as best as I can. Um, I'll start with um, The Simpsons. And, and the reason I go there is because uh, The Simpsons has had an incredible impact in, I think, uh, my adult life as far as uh, humor, comedy, certainly sarcasm, cynicism yeah. to a degree, but They're also perfectly cromulent. Uh, <laughs> but just you know, but but a, but a, just an underlying intelligence to the entire yeah. thing, um, to the entire world of The Simpsons, which is very very you know had a huge huge emotional powerful impact on me, uh, you know, during my late teenage years and certainly so since. So Homer, no, you're saying? No, 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 I'm not going to go there because we're, t we're kind of talking really it's more of a science fiction. So as an extension of that, because of course Matt Groening is the creator of The Simpsons, also the creator of Futurama. So I think I'm going to go with Fry from Futurama for, my, for, for myself. Oh, that's good. Not just because of the red hair. Um, so here, here's a character in Fry who has absolutely no specialty whatsoever. That is, that is exactly me. Pizza um, delivery. He, 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 <laughs> I've never delivered a pizza in my life. You're an accountant. And um, You have a specialty. Well, yeah, okay, but you know, a science specialty. Oh, okay, I, okay, I, okay. In, you know, because that's, that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he's surrounded, you know, in his environment future, in the future by, um, you know, great scientists, incredible inventions and technology. He certainly has a, a wonderful appreciation for it, some perhaps limited understanding, um, <laughs> uh, and has, uh, you know, a naivete about him, but at the same time, a desire to learn more. He's good humored about things. He's, um, he's uh, uh, very curious certainly uh, ab about everything that is going on around him. And yeah, he stumbles and bumbles and fails at, at certain things at certain times, but I, I think uh, that's the, sort of the line I've, I've drawn with this. Mm. Cool. I thought you were going to say Krusty the Clown. Well, uh, yes. Uh, you and, made a good and, argument for that as well. And if The well. Simpsons yeah. itself were more of a, of a science-based uh, you know, show, then maybe, maybe that would okay. have been uh, a better way to, to go about it. But since we're talking science but there is, science I fiction. Think, yeah, it's not science or science fiction, but there is a certain intellectualism to The Simpsons, which I know it sounds strange because it's a cartoon, but if you watch it, it's a very adult show. And all the subtext is actually yeah, it, and intellectual. It's, I mean, obviously, it pushes it for a comic effect, right? It yeah. takes... I think a very valid criticism of our society, and then again makes it re even more ridiculous. And Krusty the Clown, I think, as a character, has that that kind of humor. He he's he knows what he knows what time it is, right? Right. He, and he's, but he, of course he takes it to like a cynical level. Um, but at the same time, the character is, I think, very sort of genuine, and, and he's not a he's not an unfeeling character. No, it's no, almost he's like actually a, a deep mechanism. character. Yeah, if you, it's think, very if, deep, if yeah. you think about it, he's got he's got layers to him. You know, he's got his persona when he's on when he's on stage. Hi, everyone. <laughs> he's Jewish, but he's not Jewish. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and <laughs> um, so so he is one of I think the uh, deeper characters actually of the of the Simpsons franchise, and that is certainly one of the characters from the. Simpsons that I would probably identify with the most if we're going there. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's pivot. Does that, by the way, any, do any of you want to throw out who, which one of us you think uh, throw uh, out a science fiction character for any of us? Anything? What about one for Jay? Didn't we do Jay? Or Jay did just Jay did himself. The character yeah, we, was, well, we didn't have a real I, character. It was just more so of a general... I, I do tend to think of um, the captain from Firefly when I think of Jay. Oh, no. Mel? No? Yeah. I'll take that with honor. Yeah. <laughs> I think Buckaroo Banzai. Think so? <laughs> Jeff Goldblum? Yeah. I'll say no more about that. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Bob. <laughs> we, were, we were tossing around the idea of Captain Kirk for Bob. Okay. But I'm good with it's that. It's more like what, not, it's more how Bob sees himself. 
Go ahead. Just, Someone has their hand up over I'm here. Just because I'm wearing a Captain Kirk costume tomorrow does not. <laughs> Never mind. I'm not helping my <laughs> argument. Um, I think for Kira, I think uh, Jesse is Dax from Deep Space Nine. Ooh. Okay. Re Jesse repeat what she said, please. Deep I would Space repeat Nine. it, but I don't know. Dax. You guys tell me. Dax, Dax from Deep Space, Space Nine. Yeah. Dax, Dax from Deep Space Nine. For me. Yeah. 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 I'll take yeah, it. Cool. Science warrior. Science warrior. Yeah, we need more of those. Right here. Uh, For sure. That's a compliment. You mentioned uh, Stargate. Samantha Carter. Samantha Carter? Yeah, Samantha, Samantha Carter. Carter. She was, oh, how awesome was she? So, so, she saved the planet how many times? And blew up the sun. Yes. <laughs> she, was, what, she was incredible. I, I loved her. What has she done lately, though? Yeah, come on. Anybody else? Growing up, I, I definitely used to um, think of Steve as... Spock. Sure. Right, Bob? Absolutely. You definitely he, had that. He, he had, had that as a kid. argument for the doctor, but... Yeah. Uh, the doctor's a better fit, but when we grew up, it was it definitely was, yeah. Spock. Yeah. It was like, you, you know, he's half of... human, half something that doesn't have feelings. <laughs> <laughs> but Steve always had that, t that precision in his language and confidence, which was really cool. And it just, as a kid, it, it just seemed like you were like him in a way, so... And green blood. Yeah. And green blood. <laughs> I mean... You know, I don't think I ever thought of myself as Vulcan or Spock, but the, Spock was I, sure probably the most compelling character from Star Trek, right? We agree yeah. with that. I mean, you know, Leonard Nimoy sure. pulled off that yep. character yep. amazing. And Kirk. So well, yeah. Yeah, Kirk, well, yeah, Kirk <laughs> had a certain <laughs> swagger that was drove the show, and then it got, you know, it, it definitely added to the drama, but there was something about Spock that was ineffable, I think, that yeah. so many people identified with. And again, it, it is great because the, the, what was so compelling about the character was his intellect. And that's, I always got to give props to that. All right, we're going to pivot again wow. for, you know, for the next segment. Um, so this is going to be you know, more about science and science fiction. I, you know, I wanted to get your guys' thoughts on, um, let's say if we fast forward 100 years, uh, two, two questions about that. So what is the technology that you really think, or the advance could be in knowledge or, or whatever, the change uh, to humanity that you think um, is going to be the most profound? And also, is there something that you think that everyone thinks is going to be part of the future that's just never going to happen? Like, mm -hmm. we should just stop you know, putting this in our sci-fi movies because it's just not going to happen. Jay? Yeah, I shall mean... We, it, shall we say it together, Jay? Yes. Ready? <laughs> it's gonna, now it's weird, Bob. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, Let's finish together. It's, it's the singularity. It's the singularity. <laughs> it's the singularity, without a doubt. Define, uh, define that. Yeah, right. Well, well, All right, so the, is this that? is my definition, but the, the, uh, the idea that computer, computer learning and computer intelligence, I don't care if it becomes conscious or not, that's a different discussion in a sense, but the singularity means that we're going to be having an explosion of knowledge. So as an example, this is what I like to tell people. Imagine we have a machine that's thinking millions of times faster than a human could, and then we've got 10,000 of them doing it at the same time. So in the span of months where we develop nanotechnology, we develop subspace space travel, we develop infinite energy, you know, we just get hammered with these super solutions to all of the big problems that humans have. And then what happens to humanity? Who owns that technology? What happens with that technology? And how quickly do we, do we evolve away from where we are? You know, it would go from, okay, we can replace limbs. Okay, we can regrow limbs. Okay, you're never going to lose a limb because your skin is as strong as diamond. You know, like it could become yeah. obscene in a very short amount of yeah. time what we can do. I mean, that, that's one way to look at it. I tend to look at it, a, a singularity as a discontinuity, and I think that's why they call it a singularity. It's, I see it as a point in time when there's an intelligence explosion, um, as, as Jay alluded to, it's in such a way that th this intelligence explosion makes it such that, I mean, how do you anticipate, how do you think about or predict what something that is a million times smarter than a person will do or can do? You can't possibly imagine it by definition. It's like a dog trying to imagine calculus. It's just we can imagine some pretty horrible things. It's though. never sure. going to happen. So because of that, it's a kind of this veil that you, can, you can't penetrate. That's why it's a singularity, because we have no idea what the hell is going to happen beyond that. When that happens, who knows when. I think it could happen in 100 years easily. Yeah. But it's going to happen at some point if we continue. But Bob, that's why I like to quantify it. Like when I'm talking to people about it, 
you explain that, and I agree with you. Yeah, of course, yeah. there's that concept there. We can't see beyond the, the, the perimeter when, when it hits. Who knows what's going to happen? But you can say it's going to kind of be like this. We're going to get slammed with abilities, science uh, achievements, and knowledge so fast. It's not like, oh, batteries are getting a little bit better. Okay, we have driverless cars hitting the roads now. It's yeah. going to be like a thousand things like driverless cars well, yeah. in, in a week. Right. Another way to, uh, to look at it, I think, is, is the you look at the predictive horizon. We can go, say we can go out 20 years and we could, we have some success predicting what, what's going to happen in 20 years. As you approach a singularity, that horizon is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Eventually, in five years, you have no idea what's going to happen. And eventually, tomorrow, you have no idea. You know, imagine they're coming out with iPhone 7 in, uh, the later this month. And then imagine in October, they come out with I iPhone 500. It's like you, you just can't predict. That horizon just smacks you right in the face. Yeah. And it's like, what's going to happen? Who the hell knows? Are we even going to be here? Is reality going to be here? Yeah. Or are we going to be a part of the singularity, meaning is it going to be man and, and machine merge and all that stuff? So why do you think this idea is so controversial? Well, I think people are scared shitless about it. It's, it's very provocative and it is very scary <laughs> because you can't define it. And it's like, it's almost like something is coming at the earth. We don't know what it is. You can't do anything about it. It, right? This, you, nothing we can yeah. do to prevent it. It's going to happen, in my opinion. And we don't know what it's going to do, good or bad. And it's just coming, and that's it. But but another I, I another problem, it, let me just throw this yeah, out there. Yeah. Another problem, Steve, is that a lot of people just don't think that you can have an artificial superintelligence, that you can't have um, a thinking machine um, in, in, that's not electrochemistry or that's a, in a computer. They're just skeptical that we could ever create something like that. Or if we do, it's going to it's going to take ten thousand years, which is ridiculous. And I think I'm I'm in some ways one of those people. I think that um, <laughs> ooh, can you imagine? You know, I, I think one thing I learned very quickly coming onto the SGU is that um, Bob. I say this with love. You are a hardcore techno optimist. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't deny that. There's this there's this idea that all of these things are going to come, and the, you know, like the giant uh, dustbuster that comes to clean up all of the problems that we've created, or or this runaway type of technology that doesn't somehow have rate limiting steps, and uh, it also kind of just assumes that the human factor at some point is going to be taken out of the equation, yet we are the programmers. Oftentimes the type of programming that we're doing is in light of our understanding of neuroscience. You know, when we think of the most in intelligent machines, we think of neural networks that we're using within those machines, which are modeled after neuroscience. And we almost just forget about the concept of regulation. Now, obviously we know that you know, we see this all the time in legislation that we trail behind technology. You know, that the regulators and, and the legislators are always trying to keep up yeah. with how do I write laws around this. So that is a legitimate concern. But that said, let's use a very good example of Moore's Law, which is um, weaponry, right? When we think about historical weaponry, you know, we had the capability to injure somebody, we had the capability to kill one, then to kill 10, then to kill hundreds, and then to kill thousands uh, through these te technological advances. And at a certain point, when we hit sort of the nuclear arms race during the Cold War, we started thinking about deproliferation. We started thinking about, this is something we actually have to keep in check, and we started walking it backward. And I do have more faith, I think, in humanity's ability to regulate such things than I do in technology or machine's ability to somehow take control of humanity. Yeah, I don't know, and I'll, let, me, let me tell you why I don't completely mm -hmm. agree. In order to b build nuclear weapons, and I said the word wrong, I know. <laughs> I can't help it, I don't hear it. It's like a, it's like He's a- not even it, Southern like no. me. <laughs> but um, you, need, you, you need plutonium, mm -hmm. right? And that's something that everybody doesn't have their hands on. But as computer power increases, you know, there are companies, there are thousands, if not tens of thousands or more companies out there that have phenomenally powerful data centers and processing ability. And that really, it's going to be a combination of that and, and software to do this stuff. It's, going to, it's a combination of hardware and software that's everywhere. It's everywhere, all over the planet. Not only everywhere, Jay. If you, I've read, I recently read a, few, a couple books on artificial intelligence. If you look at, say, a hundred new like technology startup companies, nine-tenths of them, almost all of them, 
involve artificial intelligence mm -hmm. one way or another. Yep. It is such an immensely powerful tool. Yep. Tool. It is a tool that we will not turn away from. We are going to push and push and push, like kind yeah. of, like also nanotechnology. These 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 are technologies that are so beneficial, so enticing, so possibly game changing that. P Billions and trillions will be invested in yeah. to push those limits. Yeah, there's we, no stopping it unless it's a zombie apocalypse or an asteroid that hits. It's <laughs> going to happen. There's no turning away. So we have to prepare ourselves for that for this stuff now and talk about it and, and get ready for it. Yeah. Where's the threshold, Bob? Where, where, where's the point where we can no longer remain in control or cut it off? Well, that's what the singularity really is, right? It's, right. it's the runaway it, point. Yeah. It is the runaway point. And that's point. the thing right. that so I'm most skeptical of, is the runaway point. I don't think that there's, these are mutually exclusive ideas. I mean, I think that the, um, the le most legitimate aspect of the idea of the singularity is that once you get to the point where you have a recursive technology, yeah. it can, the rate of, um, meaning that, like you have a machine that designs a better machine that designs a better machine. See, you then you you do get you can get an exponential increase right. in the rate and of advancement a, of technology. And that's you know, a black is. box. When we that's enter a, that yeah. stage, you, that is a black box. We know what's going to go in. We have no idea what's going to come out. Our goal, if we're going to pursue artificial superintelligence, is to make sure that whatever goes into that black box is as I don't know, benign, but thoughtful, think, yeah, but humane as tool. possible. Not connected anyone to the internet. See, yeah. Anyone see the article recently a about a robot that sort of wandered out of the building against the programmer's wishes and it did this multiple times to the point where they had to shut the robot down? Did anybody read that recently? You did, Derek? I, I read that too. And, you know, we, we have this perception of control. Yeah, and I, I don't think, think I think it's sometimes a false perception. Yeah, I mean, that, that we have this control that we think we but have. How do you regulate it, though? That's the thing. How do you know what Company X is doing and name this country? How do you know? You don't know. You know, there's no way to see that. It's not like you need plutonium to do it. You just need computers. No, I don't think I don't think we know what's going to happen. I also don't think that you know we need these machines have to be conscious at any point for this to happen. For there to be a recursive I agree, technology. Yeah. You know, like Bob was talking about artificial intelligence. These are not conscious machines. This is just algorithms that are using, you know, machine learning or machine evolving yep. uh, or expert systems or whatever. There's different types of, of artificial intelligence. I'm not talking about consciousness. Not necessarily. But doesn't the fear almost always come along with this assumption that beyond this recursive aspect of the machine that somehow it will move outside of its programmed parameters and it will yeah. be capable of making decisions that are not good for humanity. Sure. I mean, that's really where the fear comes yeah, in. Yeah, that's right? the sci-fi freak show side yeah, But that's it, what yeah. most people identify. Yeah, but I don't, I don't think that necessarily has to be a component of it at all. Yeah. And that's the part that I'm most skeptical of. Well, and I think if we... I, my prediction's always been that if we do create computers that are artificially, that are conscious, it will be because we just duplicated the brain and we don't right. really even still understand mm -hmm. exactly why they are conscious. Um, yeah. That may really help us. And so, you know, that therefore we may not necessarily go beyond that. You know, and we don't, and we might just decide not to, and because we're doing fine with artificially intelligent algorithms that are not conscious and that are therefore a lot easier to predict and to control, and are just tools that we're using to crunch information that could still, again, lead to a, a situation where we have a recursive increase in certain technologies, and we see this already in certain areas. Like you could take just something I happen to be familiar with, MRI scans, you know, once we figured out how to get information out of the body by, you know, using magnetic fields to flip the spins of water molecules, then you have data. And then, you know, once we have that data digitally, now it's on a completely different progress. We you don't actually have to even improve the MRI scan itself. It's now it's just a software a problem and we are finding more and more faster and faster better and better ways of analyzing that data and producing better images so MRI technology has advanced in an accelerating way over my career over the last 20 years because it's just now it's just a matter of writing better software just other ways of of, of manipulating that information so I do think technology can get that can get itself into that groove where we, then there is some runaway, you know, improvement. But it's still totally under the control of people. I mean, we're not worried about. I hope know, so. And for people. most people, or for most by most um, definitions, the singularity implies that there is a an incalculable 
stability to it, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's the part that I'm most con concerned about. And really what worries me is when you read Kurzweil and you read the biggest sort of prophets of the singularity, they have a limited understanding of neuroscience, yeah. yet they talk about it as if we're way further along yeah. in our understanding of neuroscience than we actually are. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where I think the disconnect comes for me. It's coming for you, Kara. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> so I'll, you want to take I'll a question be dead by before then. Before we run out of time, Steve? Oh, yeah. uh, do you guys have any questions for us? <laughs> yes, you right in front. Get, get up, get, there's a microphone right there. Is that microphone working? Yeah, and maybe people should just line up if they do have them since we are running low on time. Derek, we have a hard stop when this clock runs out, right? Okay. We have yeah. time for a couple of questions. Yeah, I mean. Okay. I and questions, a, not statements. Yeah. Questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had a okay. question uh, just about skepticism in general and um, what role, like, atheism plays in that. Hmm. I know most of you are atheists. Um, I We're think, all atheists. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Atheistic. I think, Steve, you said the one thing that you would never believe or accept as proof would be like proof of God. And I, you had one um, like special speaker on your show once that, you know, that was like he really pushed the idea. But the one thing I don't get is atheism, is it atheism itself? basically a religion oh like, god what's the difference between <laughs> well i mean because you can you know obviously religions you could apply science and falsify them but at the end of the day what's the difference between a scientist believing that there's nothing that's your problem right yeah. so atheism part, versus, the absolute nature of it i think atheism is, is not a function of believing that there is no god it's a function of lacking belief in a god okay. um and i think if you make that distinction that yeah. that that answers your question right there. So that, that's, that's, I'm going to cut you off there because that's, you, you are asking us to give another hour long yeah. discussion about <laughs> a very deep topic. And maybe we'll do that as a future panel or something or talk about it on the show. And we have touched upon it. But very, very quickly, the, yeah, so first of all, it depends on how you define God. Mm -hmm. It depends on how you define atheism. Some people do approach atheism as a positive belief that there is no God, and that's fine. And there's certainly a lot of reasons to, to take that position. But that's a belief based position. It's not science. From a philosophical, scientific point of view, I'm an agnostic. I make that distinction. I'm also an atheist because I do harbor no belief. But the, um, philosophically, the, the, the most important thing is that if you, if you create a hypothesis that's unfalsifiable, then by definition you can never know if it's real or not. And there's no, you know, that's agnosticism. And then the atheism is, just says, and I'm not going to have any arbitrary belief about it one way yeah. or the other. Uh, it's like Russell's teapot, right? You know, so it, it could, is there a teapot orbiting the Earth, be, orbiting the sun between the Earth and Mars? There's no way to prove or disprove that right now. Uh, but but I'm, I'm not going to believe that there is because I have no particular reason to believe that there is. Yeah. So I'm an agnostic and an atheist, you know, t towards Russell's teapot, and I think God is the same way. And just to clarify what you alluded to in my, my previous statements, what I'm saying is if you define God as something outside the universe, then by definition, you can never know if he exists or not, because we, can, we are of the universe. We can only know about, you know, evaluate evidence within the paradigm of science. We could never really know if there is something outside of our ability to know. That yeah, like beyond physics, it's yeah. science can no longer interrogate yeah. it. Yeah, okay. It's three next and a half minutes. Yep, next next question, thanks. please. Um, what technology that exists today would have most impressed your 12-year-old self? <laughs> oh, oh the mean, internet. I mean, it's got to be the internet. Oh, the internet was around when I was 12. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Son so, of a bitch. Uh, <laughs> like a I'm going to say, no I'm going to answer with, wow. I'm 48 years old and I'm proud of it. Uh, virtual reality headsets are going to be, that would have blown my 12 year old mind out the back of my head. Yeah. Even just like multiplayer online games. Yeah. We she, were was, so, she was 10. She was wasn't 10. 12. No, no, no. So by 12, I, it was two we years were, We yeah. were <laughs> desperate for oh, yeah. that experience. Yeah. Like, oh, we all want to play together. All, we tried like for years before it actually worked. Before it got there. And so yeah, I meant at 12, if like we could like do that, I think we would have been very, very do what, Steve? That. But pl just playing like multiplayer online games. Oh my God. With yeah, the yeah. graphics that exist today. <laughs> Remember and the first yeah. crap that came out? We were enthralled by Pong. Like, I know. Wow, look at that. <laughs> like 20 pixels, that was it. It was your entire. 
<laughs> so yeah, we would be we would be freaked out. If, if How many of you have had the experience where you were like in an unfamiliar place in a new city, and you had an appointment, and you were running late, or you had to meet up with somebody, and you just pulled out your smartphone and and put it in Google Maps, and, and you had that moment of like, what did I do yeah. before I had a yeah. smartphone? Yeah. I think that's yeah. it for yeah. me. Yeah. Without a doubt, so lost. I thought that just yesterday. Yeah. How, how, yeah. What, smartphones what do do? would be my answer. Yeah. 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 Smart, yeah. yeah. Next question. I mean, it's the whole information revolution. Yeah. Yeah. Just one last point with that. I do remember getting into lots of arguments and discussions, you know, pre-internet, pre-World Wide Web, I should say. And you just sort of, at the end of it, you, you have your set of claims, I have my set of claims, and we're done, and it's yeah, you're frustrating. you're not going to go to the card pointless. catalog. Yeah, you're not yeah. going to go to the library, <laughs> you know. Um, but now it's so satisfying to just go to yeah. the computer or whip out your smartphone and go, no, you're objectively wrong. Here's, <laughs> here's the fact right here. And, you know, then they, and then they doubt your uh, your website. <laughs> oh, I don't trust that yeah. website. Yeah, right. He does that to us website. all the time, trolls, by the way, don't guys. Don't get the trolls out there. Next question, please. This is for Kara. Um, I'm an ex-Mormon as well. And I was just wondering how your growth in that religion and then exit from it informed your skepticism? Um, yeah, so I, I became an atheist before I became a skeptic. So I was a little opposite of most. And we can talk about it offline um, when we have a little bit of more time. But I, I'm kind of uncommon in that. Lots of people leave religion after they find science. And for me, it was the other way around. So I think there's something intrinsic in religion that just seemed like BS to me. I think there's a Maybe lot of I was people a like that, skeptic. I, I, yeah. I think that there's two basic groups yeah. of people in the skeptical atheist you know, overlapping communities. And there are those who love of science and critical thinking led them to sort of their beliefs eroded and they became an atheist. I think the other four of us sort of had that pathway. And then there were those who rejected religion because it had some kind of hor horrific influence on them early on. And then, you know, liking science and critical thinking, they came to that because it helped them in their rejection of religion. Yeah, or that there's something intrinsic in yeah. being kind of skeptical, like there's something about skepticism that you're drawn to, which was there from the time you were quite young, yeah. right? You yeah. always thought in that way, that's and you just didn't know. That's an interesting fa fact, isn't it? Couldn't put your finger on it until yeah. later. Yeah. yeah. Which is so cool. That is cool. We just forget that that exists. It's All like right. we're jealous. We'll do one last, last one. question. Yeah, yeah so uh, you've talked a bit today about how science fiction and skepticism work together. I was hoping that you could tell me a little bit about how you see science fiction and science working together. So. In my opinion, the the best thing with science fiction is that it's a thought experiment about science. There are a lot of terms, a lot of concepts that were first debuted in science fiction and then became incorporated into science. I can't remember them now off the top of my head. Warp but drive. Yeah, I think, warp, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of them. Though. A lot of things yeah. even that don't sound science fictiony. That just are just you take it for granted. Cell these, phone. Yeah. Yeah. Cell, phone, cell phone. Yeah. These yeah. are things that were introduced first into, into in science fiction. So that's what I love about hard science fiction is the thought experiment about science, about the future, about what our, where our knowledge is going to go and where our technology is going to go and how we're going to yeah. interface with that, how it's going to change our lives as people. So I think that's, that's the interaction. I do think that science fiction does inspire a lot of scientists, sure. a lot of kids to become scientists, but I also think there's a lot of yeah. overlap there. A lot of scientists also love science fiction because that's our playground. And also the core Solar things show. in science that feel like science Solar fiction, Solar like l exploring the universe, NASA, right? A lot of the things they do we would have thought was science fiction previously. There's an entire magazine that NASA used to publish which cataloged all of the technological advances and inventions that came out of the quest for space travel, which is really amazing. You know, even though that's not technically science fiction, what the things that NASA does, I think, at some point in time were science fiction. And it's so cool to see not just that we've accomplished that, but there's a whole array of other technologies that came from that.